Awesome. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. That's the first book of the New Testament. And a uh, really great passage of text here. Um, very challenging passage of text, though. And we are in our Vision Builders series, which uh, Vision Builders is um, encouraging people to have ownership for the vision and to outwork that ownership through sacrificially giving. And this is it's a challenging thing. You know, talking about money in church makes people feel uncomfortable. It's, it would be weird if it didn't feel uncomfortable, especially in Canada, um, in a Western Christian environment. The thing that grips our hearts the most, uh, or the thing that we don't want to talk about the most, is often the thing that we should talk about, and uh, it's because money. Because money gets in the way of God a lot. Money does get in the way of God a lot. And um, so I'm okay to um, feel a little uncomfortable, if you're okay to feel a little uncomfortable, but it's good. It's in those moments you embrace that, and then you're leaning in, and uh, and. It's where, and watch God move in your life. And uh, Elena's story is so encouraging. And um, anyone that has done what Elena has done is watching that story and be like, right, that's true in my life. Anyone that is yet to step out and trust God in, in that way financially, to trust God with your finances, might feel cynical thoughts towards that story. And that's okay too. We all, I've been there. But it's not until you step out and trust God in all areas of your life that you discover Him in those areas. You can't, you can't step out and God, step out and trust God by fasting and then have the revelation that Elena has. The revelation only comes on the ground of which the sacrifice was sown. And so, um, so we're talking about this right now as citizens. We are citizens. And last week, as I introduced the series, I was talking about that there is no back row, middle row, or front row in terms of, there's no hierarchy in, in Christianity. That, if, that as you're a citizen, you don't, you don't, you're not special before God if you have the word pastor in front of your name, like a title. Like you're not extra special. I like to think I am sometimes, but it's absolutely not true. Um, and so, you know, when you come to Christ and you place your faith in Christ, you have everything everything. You don't, you don't get it partially. This is just a little recap from last week. So, but then we're, we aren't, we're, we're then called, the challenge is, is that we're called to participate in His mission and not be bystanders or not be passive. Because um, in the Old Testament, the ones that really participated in, the, in God's mission were like the high priests, but Jesus done away with all that because He didn't want the people way on the fringes to be apathetic he wanted, he wanted all of his people to be all the partners, all the family of God and all the co-laborers. So I'm, I was literally inviting, I don't know, you might be new to our church. And, and if you're new to our church, you're invited to participate in what God is doing in this house. Even if you've been going here a month, you're invited to be a vision builder. You might not choose, you're, and you're invited to follow God's voice. You, you are obedient to God. That, that's a part, part and parcel of having this curtain that's torn is we're not looking for one person's obedience to cover everybody's obedience. That's Old Testament. New Testament now is the curtain's torn and all have access to the Holy of Holies. But the challenge with that is now we can't be lazy. We, we got to get involved. So we like one side of it, but we can't neglect the other side of it. We got to... We gotta, so you and I now that we come, come to God is there is a certain way that He asks His family to live, citizens to live. And, and so I want to talk about today the trust exchange. Somebody say trust. I want to talk about the trust exchange. Any, do we have any like, I don't, know, I don't know if it's not right to say this, but I'm a, I'm a control freak. Do we have any control freaks in the place? I'm, I'm a control, I like to control the outcome of things. Okay, if something happens to me in traffic, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I want to control it. Like, no, even if my Uber driver suggests that they, I've got a bad Uber rating because I'm a control freak. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you which way to go, all right? All right? Like, and it's just bad. I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't sit in the back seat. I'm a bad back seat driver. I, I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, like, I just, if, this building is an amazing story of like a trust exchange. And, and through the leadership of this church, God will put me in places where I'll have to trust Him. 
uh, places where like I, because what used to be walking on water for me, as I grow in capacity and faith in God, then now feels like I'm in the boat again. And that's what happens in your journey of faith. And, and, and there's, no, there's no theology in the Bible that you leap by faith. So I'm not asking for people that have never given financially before to empty your bank account. I'm asking you to obey God. And, and faith, according to Scripture, is a walk. We walk by faith. I don't know if anyone walks in leaps. Does anyone walk like this? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm like a gazelle. I know, that was impressive. I've literally pulled the hammy. Um, no, you walk by faith. Because if, I, if God asked any of us to leap in faith, we'd probably have a heart attack. You don't leap by faith. You walk by faith. You take the next step. Somebody say next step. But the next step is a trust exchange because the previous step was walking on water, but now we're in that capacity. So now that's, what, that, that's in the boat for us. So you constantly have to step out of the boat and trust Jesus again. Okay, now this new capacity is comfortable. Step out of the boat. And Jesus will only lead you in, in the way that you can bear. He's, he's, he's a gentleman in that way. And, and he, leads, he leads us in that way. And, uh, and this building was like, so at different points in the journey of this church, I, I, I believe that God is doing something great across Canada and in Toronto and in Hamilton. And, and, and I'm like, you know, there are times where I feel like I can do it better than God. Is that a bad confession to make? You're all like, oh, shame on you. Like you guys aren't backseat drivers in the life of God. God's the pilot. You try and hijack the plane, don't do it. You try, you try and control the plane of your destiny? Yeah, that's called hijacking. Don't do that to Jesus. Give him the wheel. And so, so I, you know, we get to this point where we have a crisis, and a crisis will cause us to question our faith. And we had a crisis as a church, like not even this time last year, less than a year ago, as Jess said, the reason why we can do a Good Friday in-person service is because we've never had the ability to rent a facility on Good Friday before. It just wasn't an available option to us. And how amazing is that, that we can, we can do this now and, and what we're using, this Friday coming at our Midtown location, we're doing an awesome event at the end of March break for Urban Promise and we're going to pack that place out with teenagers um, that wouldn't normally have like awesome parties and stuff and for a whole day event, there's going to be this awesome thing that's going on at our Midtown. We didn't have that ability before and, and, and so we get to this crisis where we can no longer rent schools and, and it was a very abrupt thing and they were kicking us out and it was, and it was challenging and we were con I'm trying to control the outcome, telling the staff, all right, let's comb the city and we're looking for venues there, it's too expensive, not available, all these different things. Nothing was working out and I get frustrated before God. But it's that frustration when you're trying to control the outcome, you're gripping tightly and you're squeezing it and, and God's cool, you know, God is so patient painstakingly, frustratingly patient. <laughs> Is any, am I relating to anybody? Like he's seated on the throne, chill, his feet are up on the earth, it's a footstool, it's kind of kicking back, eating heavenly Doritos. <laughs> Just chill, God is chill. Why, he's not biting his nails, freaking out about your life, but he's biting his nails, wondering if you will surrender to him. He's not sure, and he's cool to wait a little longer. So you stop trying to find your spouse in your own strength. See what I did there? I'm trying to help out some single people. You can trust God with your future more than you can trust yourself with your future. That's a word for somebody. And so finally, give up, surrender, and then all of a sudden, the following day, like literally we had no answers. And this has happened multiple times through the journey of our church because the leader of this house, Sam, is a control. Um, I, I struggle to give God control because I'm, re I'm relating to you. And, and, and so it got to the point where the Monday morning after I just announced to the church we didn't have anywhere to meet the following week, I just, it's day after Father's Day, I cry out to God. I'm like, all right, God, I give up. And he's like, oh, man, finally. That one was a tough one, Sam. <laughs> like, you're, you're, man, you are a one stubborn dude. That's, that's the word I got from God. It's like. Thanks, God. So, 
Surrender to God. 4.22 p.m. the same day on that Monday, I get a random text from someone I hadn't spoken to in months. I tell you, you gotta recount the stories of the past. That's what the Israelites failed to do, was recount the fact that God parted an ocean. God parted a Red Sea. What are you doing taking matters into your own hands again? What are you doing complaining that he's not gonna provide for you again? Like that wasn't like a subtle thing. You literally walk past a killer whale. I don't know. But God can, man, he can be so blatantly obvious in our past and man, we can be so hard-hearted and miss it so many times. But we're in a new level and so the new trials and the new test of tomorrow, just they, they kind of resemble what they used to be, but they're a little different. And so... Um, 4.22 p.m., get this thing. It's like, hey, listen, I got a developer friend that has this Catholic church, and I don't know what your needs are as a church, but uh, you, you know, I'm just throwing this out there. If, if you need a building, that might be available to you. I, I just couldn't believe it. You know, of course, God is God again. <laughs> I call, call up the guy, I'm like, can I meet tomorrow? We met the following day, and the rest is history. And now, this, and the pride of my heart is, I don't know, but... Maybe if we didn't come into that crisis and I did get that call and did get that PDF of this building, maybe I would have never have said that this is like, maybe I would have passed it up out of pride. Ah, oh, church is too good for this. Maybe, I don't know. But how many people are grateful for the thing that we're sitting in and that this is a miracle? It's a miracle. And you, and you gotta think like that because this is trust exchange and it's not easy to trust God. Not in our society. You know, we send missionaries over to the other side of the world sometimes out of pride and arrogance. How dare us? What, we think we got it all together? No, we need missionaries from that side of the world to come over and tell us how to trust God. Because in our Western culture, we got so many idols up in our heart. I think it would do us some good to actually go and be exposed to how some people are poor in spirit and how they're the ones inheriting the earth. When we think we're, we're on our high castle and we think we've got it all together. Okay. Too hard, too quick? All right. Matthew chapter 16, let's read this. It's such a good, this is Peter. Peter's struggling with the same thing. From that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. Somebody say suffer. Suffer many things. Jesus, like Jesus the good guy. If there was ever a perfect Canadian, it would have been Jesus, like he was so good. At the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers, the people that he loved and the people, are you kidding me, his own, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. He even knew that there was gonna be a good outcome. Even though you know, anybody know that God's gonna be good at the end of the day? Anybody know that at, at, at the end of the day, all things are gonna work together for good? But that doesn't mean that the three days in between ain't gonna be really hard. You and I go through some stuff, and that stuff is super challenging. And, it's tough, and, and sometimes it's hard to think like, and Peter, so Peter took him, verse 22, took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. I mean, <laughs> the audacity. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Are you kidding me? This is where we get jacked up theology, thinking, okay, if Jesus is God's son, now Peter just had that revelation just had the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, is in fact God, the creator of the universe's son. Now, if there was anyone that was ever going to be immune to suffering, it would be God's own son, right? Because we have this messed up theology that when bad things happen to us, it's because of some sort of standing before God. And when good things happen to us, it's because of some sort of standing before God. But that, and what do we do when crisis happens in our life? Tragedy. Suffering, and, 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 and it's happened to me before, and I question God's goodness. When my mom, one example is when my mom had an aneurysm all of a sudden and passed away at the age of 57 in the first year of our church plan. And, you know, I was pitying myself and guilty and ashamed because I looked on when people used to use, like, um, Skype. That's right, I even forgot the program. No offense, Skype. Um, <laughs> um, so, but I looked at my communication history and it was 30 days earlier that I had spoken to her. And I felt like a bad son. I never got to say goodbye to my own mom. I had a crisis. Why? 
And you and I, you, you, you would have your own examples of like, well, isn't God good? Peter couldn't get it. I don't, I don't understand. Like what you're saying, Jesus, can't be true. Because the conclusion in Peter's mind was suffering wasn't part of the equation. And Western Christianity has a theology that is about the elimination of suffering. Preachers all around North America will preach many messages about how, you know, you're going to follow God and life's going to be blessed and life's going to be better. And, blah, 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 blah. and of course, but it, it can set people up for a real bad expectation gap. Because as you come, and you might be brand new to being a Christian, and, and if you come in here and I'm saying to you, man, when you follow Jesus, it's all going to be good. That's true, kind of. Depends what you're defining it as. It's all going to work out good, for sure. And why do you need the Prince of Peace? Only because you're going through a storm. So you will suffer many kinds of trials. And this is, and so we got to, but there is a reformation of good theology coming into the church, which actually says, in actual fact, by following Jesus, you join in with his sufferings, which is crazy. It means when you really behave like a citizen of heaven and a disciple of Jesus, people ain't going to like you. You will be marginalized. And if you're not, you're probably not doing it right. Do you want that life? Why would anyone, we just sung the lyrics on the screen and this screen is really big. With joy, I take the cross. Okay, let's read it because Jesus talks about this. He says, and so Peter couldn't get it. Verse 23, Jesus turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Because Jesus knew that God was requiring something of him. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I want to make sure that when you and I are sacrificing for the call of God on our lives, that we have the concerns of God at mind, not our own concerns. If we have our own concerns always at the top of our mind, we will never actually give up anything for God. Jesus said to his disciples, and this crazy, this is crazy stuff. And we've got to talk about whoever wants to be my disciple must. Somebody say must. It's pretty conclusive right there. Must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross. Are you kidding me, Jesus? This is not what I signed up for. Deny, the word deny there means to renounce. It means to cull off. It means to sacrifice something, separate. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Huh? But whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange, the trust exchange, for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory. He's talking about the second coming with his angels. And they will reward, reward each person according to what they have done. So when you read that, what is the thing that God is looking for? If, he, if you and I are going to be rewarded for the way, what we have done, if I was reading that, I am reading that, and I'm asking the question at the end, do I want the reward that is a heavenly reward? Okay, let's all be honest. Yes, we want the reward. We want, that's what I preached last week, is that there's two types of life. And the challenge to the church was, is evaluate your priorities. It's either gold, silver, and precious stone, or it's wood, hay, and straw, and it's going to be tested by fire. Your life, my life, and it's, and it's a priority question. It's a value question. Is what I value in this life, in the eyes of Jesus, does he consider it worthless or valuable? And I want to make sure that my concerns are his concerns. I want to make sure that my priorities are his priorities. And this is saying, well, we're going to get rewarded by what we have done. So what is he looking for should be the question. And I want to tell you that this whole book from cover to cover is summed up in this hum hum human crisis. It's either... Trust in self or trust in God. How do I know that? The two trees in the Garden of Eden, that's where it starts. 
You're either going to trust God and do it his way, or you're going to trust yourself and do it your own way. And so citizens of heaven, number one, truly trust God, truly trust God. He will reward people. So this is what he's looking for. He will reward us based on our faith. Faith pleases God, right? Okay, so, but faith without works is dead. So you can't just say, I have faith in God. James, the book of James will call that out of you in a heartbeat. James is all about, show me. Show me. Huh? Huh? You're lucky that Jesus' brother James is not preaching the vision builders' messages. Okay, citizens have truly trust God. So what is, this is what he's looking for. Did I depend on God? Did I trust God with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding or did I do it the other way? And Jeremiah in chapter 17 gives us the two pictures of a blessed life and a cursed life. Okay, I wanna tell you that we are a prosperity gospel church. I love messing like this, I love it. No, because what's your definition of prosperity? That's the, that's the question. A lot of the reason why people have an issue with prosperity gospel churches is because they're defining it in material possessions. But the Bible has a picture of prosperity. It's, it's life. And so let's talk about it. Jeremiah chapter 17. And it's this idea of like a bush in a wasteland or a tree planted by rivers of living water. So Jeremiah 17 verse 5 to 8 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed, cursed is the one who trusts in man and draws strength from mere flesh. So, and this is the trick, is that there is an illusion of strength. You have intelligence, you have education, you have biceps, you have willpower, you have, you have, there, you have, a, Money in your bank account, time at your hands. And the promise there is an illusion of strength. And, the, but, but if we put all our effort and all our trust in that, it produces what the Bible says is a cursed life. Okay, this is challenging. Whoever draws strength from mere flesh and, and whose heart turn away from the Lord. What does the Bible say in Matthew chapter six? It says, where your treasure is there, your heart is also. So what I need to do in my life is I need to live a repentant life that returns treasure back to God because I'm not turning the money to Him, I'm turning my heart to Him. Because I want to make sure that I never follow the temptation of material possessions that this is where my strength comes from. The biggest investment and the greatest security and equity that I have is my faith in Christ. Whose heart turns from the Lord, that person will be like a bush in the wasteland. So turn to the neighbor, turn to your neighbor, someone here in the room and say, don't be that shrub. Don't, don't be this bush in the wasteland. They will, they will not see prosperity when it comes because there's an illusion of prosperity. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in the salt land where no one lives. Okay, so I've got this picture of this shrub in the wasteland. This, and, it, and it's, this is, I mean, it's planted it's like it's in the ground, it's living. I mean, this one looks dead, but it, foliage would be produced. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's some good that comes out of, like, it's, I'm, I'm not accusing everybody that doesn't play, place faith in Jesus that they're a bad person or they're wrong or, or useless. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, but in comparison to the way God wants us to live is it doesn't look like this other picture. This is the other picture. It's, it's what the Bible says is we are called to be oaks of righteousness. And so if you read verse 7 and 8, it says, but blessed, somebody say blessed. blessed. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Jesus is the stream. The river of, of water, the, the Spirit of God that sends out its roots by the stream, it does not fear when heat comes. Not if heat comes, when heat comes. It does not fear. The antidote to anxiety right there. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and, and never fails to bear fruit. It's interesting, I didn't say this in the first service, but Malachi chapter three, talking about the tithe, also talks about bearing fruit. Just interesting. 
And so we see these contrasting pictures. We see the shrub, which is, put the shrub back up. So we see this, this vulnerable, fragile, weak, isolated, alone, not the way God called us to live. And I'm contrasting it like this because we can think we're doing good, but we need to take it to God. We need to let God speak to us. And money is a way. And I would argue, and this is the challenge, is that, is that money is the way in Western cultures that represent whether, what we truly place our trust in. Jesus said you can't serve two masters, and the master that he had an issue with was finances. He, de- he doesn't think that you're serving the devil. He's worried about you serving yourself. And the other picture, this, this tree, this is, this is you. It's you and I planted like Psalms chapter 1 who meditates on the book of the law and we follow God and we're an oak of righteousness. And, and my wife, it was even pointing out, it just, it just looks like it's useful. You can come and shade. Like you can be someone for something else, for someone else. That this tree provides, is, can be a provider. The shrub doesn't look like it can provide anything. You know, someone's desperate in life. You wanna be someone that can be loving thy neighbor, and you can actually be able to have that vision to love God with all your heart and all your strength and everything and, and love your neighbor. Okay, number two. So there's, there's number one, which is citizens truly trust in God. Number two, true trust in God requires us to surrender something. Peter didn't get this. Jesus was literally walking out. He was the example. And Peter was like, The example of ultimate trust. Jesus was laying his life down on the cross, gonna go into the tomb and come out three days later. Either God was lying or he wasn't. And Jesus confessing it. I believe Jesus was confessing it over his own life. That's why he said, that's why he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, because if Peter kept talking, I wonder if Jesus felt tempted to disobey God. Like Peter would have been a stumbling block to Jesus to say, come on, you know, God's not gonna, no, he just, he, listen, if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna embrace the crown of thorns, the whips on the back, the ridiculing, the slapping, I'm gonna sweat blood out of my pores and I'm gonna walk this road towards Jerusalem and obey God in the most ultimate self-sacrificing way, I need you to shut your mouth, buddy, because this ain't easy. And, and, and this whole trust exchange is, ask yourself, like, are you okay for God to require from you? Because we also have this other modern theology that we want all the benefits of the kingdom without the pathway of the kingdom. So, so we want all the trimmings, but we don't want the things that the kingdom says is the way to get those trimmings. Self-sacrifice, suffering, persecution, trial, surrender, these aren't happy, clappy words. But the Bible says is that we should face it with joy. And so true trust in God requires us to surrender something. I'm married. Here is my beautiful wife, Jess. And she's not my beautiful wife just this week. <laughs> I know, it's awkward, isn't it? I'm trying, but you know, when I married Jess 16 years ago, I didn't say to her, okay, I'm gonna give you my whole life and I'm gonna, um, but I'm not gonna surrender, surrender my singleness. So in order to commit to her, I had to surrender something. I had to surrender the fact that I wasn't gonna be with any other woman, I wasn't gonna sleep around, I wasn't gonna whatever, and I'm gonna commit to her. Okay, well, psh, that's too much to ask for. That is too much to ask for. I should be able to live the blessed life of a committed life, but also the blessings that I think are blessings of living however I want. You guys are probably thinking, man, that is ridiculous. Like, no one should ever commit themselves to someone that has that kind of an attitude. Absolutely. But we do this as Christians to God all the time. We say, God, I love you with all my heart and all my soul. And he's like, do you know the definition of all? Because I'm looking at your heart and it's pretty segregated. He's like, I get this whole portion of the pie, I get this 33% or whatever, but I'm looking at this other thing and this other thing, and he seeks the Lord in Chronicles of those hearts that are fully committed to him. And you do it through faith. 
you and I do it through faith. And so we got to, if we're going to surrender everything, we have to be prepared that he's going to require something from us. Like the rich young ruler that comes to him and he says, oh, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? And God actually tells him and he doesn't do it. We pray that prayer all the time because it's the thing that's got our heart that we don't want to let go of. So we have this, we have this weird idea in Western Christianity. But the cool thing is, is that death, according to Christianity, always comes before life. See, atheists believe, atheists believe you live and then you die. Christians believe you die, then you live. And so the question is not, the, the question is, is what is God calling to, what is God requiring from you? Can he speak to every area of your life? And maybe for some of us that, that even in the process of something as practical as financially giving is just an opportunity for us to test our own heart. And listen, I'll go as far to say this, because if you think I'm preaching a manipulative message so that you would give to vision builders, I'm sorry, I don't want you to think that. I would be happy for you to take this preach and outwork it in a different church. I totally would just to disarm any cynics under the sound of my voice. Because it's not about that. It is about your heart. And is it about your confession to God that it's integrous with your actions. And that God is not trying to look down on our church filled with a bunch of idolaters. That God is looking at our church and we are fully consecrated and surrendered cross bearers. That's, that's, that's kind of the message here. And it, and it doesn't say if, it says must. We must, if we want to be a citizen of God, if we want to be a disciple of Jesus, it is challenging. I'm not saying it's not challenging. Because this is the temptations of our lives. But Romans, it's all for God's glory. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says this, For I consider the sufferings for this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. We understand as Christians that death precedes life, but we also understand that death is temporary. Death is not permanent. As a Christian, Jesus knew the tomb had to happen, but he knew it was only going to happen for three days. That's where hope comes. I mean, man, if there is anything to say amen about, that is the ultimate amen. No matter what sickness, what tragedy, what harm comes your way, you know that trial, pain, and death is simply temporary. As a Christian, you know that in heaven we have all hope in Jesus Christ because pain and death and trial is not your destiny. Your destiny is hope in God. Your destiny is heaven. Heaven. So that's really encouraging because as hard as it feels right now, it has an expiry date because he's coming back because this is not our life. This is just the vapor of our lives. Our lives are eternal. That's a super, super, super encouraging thing. Amen. Last point, I'll get the keys up. So it's challenging to give something up if we think it's lost or dead. But it's not challenging to give it up if we get this third point. The seed in the hands of God is never lost or dead. It is sown. It is sown. Jesus, they, when, when Jesus was talking to, about Lazarus from John chapter 11, he wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, two words. John eleven thirty five. 35. Now, Jesus was crying, but he knew and already said the promise that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So what was he crying about? He wasn't crying because his buddy had died, because he was about to have a latte with his buddy. What was he weeping about? If you read the story, he was troubled and angry by their lack of faith. He was like, you're not getting it. Lazarus is a seed sown. And then he gives them the reason so that you would give God the glory. It's for your benefit. That's what he says. This, the fact that we went through a little pressure and a little struggle and then this building came out of it is a seed sown. It's a testimony that would encourage your and my faith. 
the fact that you go through a trial, that you go through a hardship and voluntarily, that's what Lent's about, is, is repentance and fasting. Fasting is voluntarily picking up your cross because you know that it's in these little trials that there's glory coming on the other side. So Jesus was the ultimate seed. John 12, verse 24 to 25, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat plant, this is John's version of the same verse from Matthew. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, unless it is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. It remains limited like the little shrub. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life, in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing about this life in the world will keep it for eternity. It's a trust exchange. It's like, if you look at, put up the shrub again, if you look at the shrub, this is somebody that holds life in their own hands, but then the shrub repents, gets baptized, comes to God, plays faith in God and dies into the ground. Put up the other image, comes up, born again. New life. But that is the process. There is no being the shrub and going, I'm going to work really hard to be the oak of righteousness. I'm going to need God. I'm going to do it all in my own strength. I'm going to become, this shrub is going to become this amazing tree. No, it's surrender. There is no shortcutting it. That is the only way. So you want God's redemptive plan over your friendships? Surrender them. You want God's redemptive plan over your marriage? Surrender it to God. You want God's redemptive plan over your finances? Surrender it to God. And you will find life after death, life after death, life after death, like this, the kernel, the seed, it is when you put it in the hands of God. And I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that if you give God money, it's gonna come back to you in its same form. Maybe, maybe not. There are some stories where people give God finances and it returns tenfold, thirtyfold, a hundredfold back to them, just like we heard Elena's story. There are some things that when we're open-handed with God, we give it to God and it comes back in a different form, but it's more glorious nonetheless told the story in the first so I'm like totally running out of time but for me that was giving up drums I like grew up from an eight-year-old playing drums they were they, they this was my thing any good drummer drums are an idol you, you can't you can't be a good drummer without making drums an idol um but you know I'd be like you know what are the symbols I'm getting what are the drums I'm getting I'm kind of design my kid it was like a one-of-a-kind thing and it was it was but, but this was my life I was going to be a musician all the way through my life and at one point God long story short asked me to be open-handed with it let it go I was like well, what does that mean like this is all I know what to do for some people in the room you got to surrender your whole destiny to God well, you know, you're an amazing business person with a whole bunch of awesome clients. And if you put that in God's hands, He might bless it. And He might make your business even more fruitful. Or He might totally change your career direction. Does it matter? No, it's not the point. But whatever comes back, and I am so grateful that I let go of that. Because what I have gained by actually trusting God is far above anything that I would ever ask, think, or imagine. I, it, it wasn't even in my peripheral to do what I'm doing now. You can trust God. Somebody say trust. Just bow your head and close your eyes. And everybody watching online, just bow your head and close your eyes. Maybe the trust exchange, maybe the very thing that you need to give God is your very own life, your own heart. Maybe you've never made a decision to invite Jesus into your heart and to trust Him with your whole life. That's the most important decision that you and I will ever make. And if you're here in the room or watching online, we're gonna take a moment right now and, we, and we're gonna pray a prayer to God that gives Him our lives. And maybe you've never prayed this prayer and, and this, is, this is your time to pray this prayer. 
to say, God, I wanna give my whole heart to you. I wanna give you my life. I wanna trust you with everything. Or maybe you've once made this decision, but you've walked away from God and you know you need to recommit your life to God. You need to re-give Him your heart. You've taken matters into your own hands and you've been doing it in your own strength, but you know you, know you need to give it back to God. And if you're one of those two people, what we're gonna do is in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand so I can acknowledge it before heaven. And when you raise your hand, it's gonna be like saying, God, I wanna pray this prayer. I wanna pray a prayer that makes my life right with God. I wanna pray a prayer that recommits my life to God. And then we're gonna stand up together as a whole church community and we're gonna pray this prayer together as a church community. So if that's you, if you're in the room or watching online, who is there right now? You're like, yes, that's me. With nobody looking around, just keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. Thank you, I see it. Who else is there? Raise your hand up nice and high so I can acknowledge it before heaven. Is there anybody else? Yeah, I see it. You can put it down. Two more people. Is there anybody else? You're like, yes, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Who else is there in this place? I believe there's people responding online. I see it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Awesome. There's at least four people lifted up their hands. Is there anybody else that wants to join these people? You can trust God with all your heart. Amen. I see it. I see it, brother. Awesome. Why don't you just stand to your feet right across the room and I'm believing with anybody that's responding online as well. Amen. Why don't we just give God some praise. Amen. So good. It's always this way. The blessed life comes from dying first. So often we want God to bless us so then we can trust Him. It doesn't happen that way. We place our faith in Him first and we live blessed because of it. I know. It's, it's a challenge. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross for me. Forgive me of my sin for doing it on my own. Apart from you, I can do nothing. And I thank you that with you, all things are possible. Jesus, I make you my Savior and my Lord and help me follow you from this moment. In your name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, give God some praise, amen.